All right, welcome everyone. Yes, happy new year. Happy 2022, can you believe it? Oh my goodness. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Lynn Vartan and I'm the curator of Apex Events. Uh, for those of you who are in the Apex class, welcome. I am your instructor for the class. We um, often have a first class meeting, but this week we didn't. We just had a first event, off we go. If you have any questions or wanna say hello, please, please come up, introduce yourself. Um, you do have a quiz that's open about how the class works so make sure you take care of that. And if you have any questions or just want to say hi, please do anytime. All right, so that's the bit of housekeeping. In January of each year, we start out our Apex season with a very special event, which is our Faculty Distinguished Lecture event. So that's what today's event is. And that event is a great collaboration um, between different entities on campus, most namely the Tanner Center, who has sponsored this event since 1981. And a little bit about the Tanner Center. The Grace A. Tanner Center for Human Values was created through an endowment provided by the Tanner Trust for Universities by Obert C. Tanner, um, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Utah, and the founder and former chairman of the O.C. Tanner Jewelry Company. So the Tanner Center talks about humanities, human values, these kinds of things, and one of the great things that it does is sponsor this event. Um, and so what happens with this event is that uh, professors from campus submit their works to a faculty committee for review, and one of those works each year is chosen to be presented at this event. So we are really excited about that. That's a little bit about how this event came to be and what it is. Um, and again, it happens every year in January. To introduce our guest, we have another esteemed faculty member on campus. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kyle Bishop uh, to introduce our guest for the day. Welcome, Kyle. All right, I'm super excited that uh, we get to hear from one of the English department faculty today. And I'm just thrilled that it is Dr. McCone. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the search committee that um, located her. Actually, she revealed herself to us by sending in an application. Uh, we were super impressed right out of the gate uh, with what she had been able to accomplish so far in her career. And in fact, I, I very clearly remember one of us on the committee saying, there's no way we're gonna get her here. We're not gonna be able to get somebody of her caliber. But we did, and we're so happy to have you here because you add so much to the department and to the programs on campus. But Dr. Julie McCone is an assistant professor of English here at SU, according to my math, uh, fifth year. So she's, she is just burning it up. She grew up in Texas. Uh, Julie earned her bachelor's degree in literary studies from the University of Texas at Dallas her master's in English from the University of Texas of the Permian Basin, and her PhD in English from the University of Texas at Arlington, so all around the state. She joined our faculty in 2017. Her teaching and research interests are wide ranging and include early American literature, which is the primary reason we hired her to teach all the early stuff, but also animal studies, which uh, impressed us quite a bit. We don't have an animal studies expert, and now we do, which is awesome. Uh, women writers, very important, hip-hop music, completely out of my wheelhouse, and the digital humanities. She also discovered a previously unknown poem by the 18th century African-American poet Jupiter Hammond, which introduced her to the wonders of archival research. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, she is Indiana Jones. She does very daring and exciting archival research, discovering lost poems and bringing them back to us safely. Her recent publications have focused on early African-American literature, 19th century American poetry, and 19th century women's periodicals. Dr. McCone will be presenting her research on American naturalist and taxidermist Martha Maxwell. How many taxidermists can you name? Well, one, Martha Maxwell. Maxwell became famous in the 1870s for her skill and expertise in collecting and preserving specimens of Colorado wildlife. While not the first American woman naturalist, Maxwell is the earliest extent example of one acquiring and preparing animal specimens, engaging in the messy, dangerous, and bloody work previously left to her male counterparts. Despite Martha Maxwell's skill and fame as a taxidermist in the 19th century, she is virtually unknown today. 
Dr. McCone is working to change that by introducing the story of a woman whose lifelong passion and dedication to both work and education make her a pioneer in more ways than one. So let us learn from Dr. McCone today and uh, celebrate her success with her recent publication. I give you Dr. McCone. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Bishop, for that introduction. I think calling me Indiana Jones is like wildly overpromising, um, but I've never heard that before. I like it. Um, so yeah, um, I am so excited and honored to get to talk to you all today about my work with Martha Maxwell or on Martha Maxwell and recovering her story. So woman's work. What does that mean? Can it be possible anyone wishes us to believe a woman did all this? Thus begins Mary Dart's 1879 book, On the Plains and Among the Peaks, or how Mrs. Maxwell made her natural history collection. So those questions were coming from a curious visitor, one of many who was gawking at an enormous taxidermy display that was part of the Philadelphia Centennial International Exposition. That's a long name. Uh, usually shortened to Centennial. Um, but it took place in 1876, represented, or, uh, marking the centennial of the country. So the display was titled Woman's Work, uh, and it was truly massive. It took up one whole side of the show building that it was housed in. Uh, it was a total of 47 mammal species and 224 bird species that were native to the American West. Uh, the animals were arranged in natural groupings with some leaping through the air. Um, it was placed on this artificial landscape that even had running water as part of it. Um, so the specimens ranged everything from giant bison and elk uh, to teeny tiny hummingbirds that she had preserved. Um, and the center of the exhibit uh, was this little cave in which its creator, Martha Maxwell, would retire to when she needed a break from all of the relentless questions that visitors had. And you can kind of see the entrance to the cave there and Martha Maxwell, of course. So at the Centennial Exposition, Maxwell had become a minor celebrity. She repeatedly sold out of photographs of herself and of her exhibit. Um, you know, and her taxidermy was this smash hit, both with the general public, but then also very well regarded by the scientific community. Yet, uh, that groundbreaking taxidermy work was quickly forgotten and still largely unknown today. Um, which makes sense, because when I was telling people what my presentation was about, they're like, wait, who? I've never heard of her. It's like, yeah, hence this presentation. Uh, she's frequently overlooked in favor of other pioneering taxidermists, uh, including William Hornaday and Carl Akeley. Now you know two more names of taxidermists. Um, so, you know, Maxwell is not the first uh, American woman naturalist, uh, but she is the earliest example of an American woman who was doing taxidermy and doing work with animals in this very, like, physical, bloody, you know, kind of dangerous endeavor. Um, and her skill and expertise at that, so it wasn't just this novelty of, oh, a woman's doing taxidermy, she was actually really, really good at it. Um, and it was showing that a woman was every bit as capable at a, as a man at excelling at the scientific and artistic endeavor of taxidermy. So my talk today is gonna give you, uh, obviously, a lot of information about Martha Maxwell, but I'm also going to reintroduce the 1879 book, On the Plains and Among the Peaks, uh, or how Mrs. Maxwell made her natural history collection. Uh, this was written by Maxwell's half-sister, Mary Dart. Uh, like Maxwell's taxidermy, Dart's writing has been lost to history. Uh, it's long been out of print, previously only available by interlibrary loan, or you can find like digital facsimile copies online. Um, but the book is in fact a significant literary artifact. Um, it's an important source of information about Maxwell and her taxidermy. Um, it also offers us a really interesting account of life in the American West as this kind of contested and contradictory space. 
Um, it's a space where women both conform to and break out of gendered expectations, where Native Americans are regarded both as romanticized others and as sort of this, and regarded with generalized annoyance at the same time, um, and a space where animals are seen both as sentient, intelligent beings, but then also as this raw, organic material that is being used to promote scientific progress. So in recovering on the plains and among the peaks, um, my critical edition of Dart's book, you can see the cover there, uh, was published just last month by the University Press of Colorado. So this new edition expands our understanding of both 19th century women's history and literature, as well as women's place in the history of science, um, areas that are often overlooked. So just kind of an outline of where I'll be going in my presentation. Um, I'll talk a little bit first about how I came across Maxwell and Dart, um, sort of how I found them. Uh, then I'll give you a little bit of a biography about Martha Maxwell. She did really have a fascinating life. Then I'll talk a little bit about Dart's book, On the Plains and Among the Peaks, and then wrap up. So I was first introduced to Martha Maxwell and Mary Dart about seven years ago. Uh, and my introduction was similar to the curious visitor who begins Dart's book. Um, it was gawking at a picture of woman's work. I wasn't in, you know, seeing it in person, but I was seeing a picture of it. Um, I came across it while I was thumbing through a book um, of biographies of early women naturalists. Um, and I was just stunned by this photograph. And I remember thinking, please tell me that she did the taxidermy. Um, and you know, when I read the entry on her, you know, I found out, yes, she'd done the taxidermy. But wait, there's more. She also did the hunting and collecting and retrieving of all of these specimens. Um, and you know, that just got me super, super excited. Um, because seven years ago, I was still a doctoral student at University of Texas at Arlington. And you know, Martha Maxwell and her taxidermy fit perfectly with my dissertation research. Um, so I was working on early American natural history, particularly focusing on animal bodies um, and sort of the interplay between the physical animal specimens and the texts that were inspired by them. Uh, and my research was at that point filled with the works of male naturalists. So people like Han Sloan and Mark Catesby, I'm sure probably no one in the audience has heard of those names before, um, but also John James Audubon, that's probably a name that at least people have some vague recognition. Um, but all of these male naturalists were working with animals. Um, but at that point, before I found Maxwell, there was a complete lack of women naturalists in my work. Um, and that's really just because most of the female naturalists working in the early American period were all working with plants. So you know, people like Jane Colden, Almira Phelps, Susan Fenimore Cooper, they're all focusing on botany. Even a later naturalist like Mary Treat, who was working in the later 19th century, she did expand into the animal kingdom, but only as far as insects and arachnids. So, you know, I was actively trying to find out were there any early American female naturalists that were working with animals in this kind of messy, visceral way. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that if I didn't include any in my dissertation, it wasn't going to be a lot from a lack of trying on my part. So that was why I was just so incredibly excited when I saw this photograph and learned about Maxwell as this taxidermist and naturalist. That quickly led me to uh, Mary Dart's book. And you know, when I started reading Mary Dart's book, that just got me even more excited um, and just more deeply fascinated in Maxwell, both because it was just a gold mine for my dissertation. I was like, score, this is perfect for my work. Um, but then also, it was just a fascinating text in and of itself. Um, I just found so many things in it that were just so compelling to me. So just one kind of example of sort of the writing and the scenes in the book that I was so captivated with. So there's one passage in Dart's book. Um, she's talking about this 1873 trip um, that Maxwell took southeast of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and Maxwell comes across this mother skunk who is nervously protecting her young and kind of running back and forth between it and the hunters. Um, you know, and Maxwell you know, kind of expresses admiration for the skunk, saying, I declare it's a shame to kill anything capable of manifesting so much affection, but she must die sometime. And if that time is now, she may be saved the pangs that are so often caused by ungrateful children. Yeah, 
kind of an, an odd detail. Um, and then Maxwell then immediately unceremoniously shoots the two skunks with the promise that she's going to transform them into specimens for her taxidermy collection. So this is just one of several kind of uh, episodes from the book that shows what I find really fascinating about Dart's writing. You know, because Dart could have very easily edited out those details. Um, she didn't have to anthropomorphize the animals the way she does. But by choosing to give us that scene, you know, it is kind of creating this really compelling, exciting, and strange narrative that is really highlighting the tensions and contradictions um, and the work of Martha Maxwell, who is one of America's pioneering naturalists. So now I'll give you a little biographical sketch of Maxwell um, so you can kind of maybe have some more context. So Martha, Ann, or Martha Maxwell was born Martha Ann Dart um, in, or on July 21st, 1831. She was born in northern Pennsylvania to Amy and Spencer Dart. Spencer uh, died in 1833 of scarlet fever, and then Amy married his first cousin Josiah in 1841. Uh, and the couple went on to have two daughters, Maxwell's half-sisters, Sarah and Mary. Mary, of course, being the writer of On the Plains and Among the Peaks. So the Dart family settled in Wisconsin in 1845. And then in 1853, Martha, who is pictured there on the screen on the left, uh, met her husband, James A. Maxwell, pictured up there on the screen as well. Um, Maxwell was a prominent businessman in Baraboo, Wisconsin. He was 20 years older than Martha and had, was a widower who had six children. Uh, they married in 1854, and a couple years later, in 1857, they had their only child, Mabel, uh, born in 1857. Uh, these are two pictures of her up here, and I just love how excited she is in that picture on the, on the right. She's surrounded by her mother's taxidermied bird specimens, and she just looks super jazzed to be there. Um, she actually was kind of very, uh, very kind of conflicted and had sort of bitter memories of her mother's work as a taxidermist in her later life, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, so the Maxwell's family finances were devastated by the economic panic of 1857. This led to the decision uh, for both Martha and James to move to Boulder, uh, Boulder, Colorado in 1859. They were hoping to cash in on the Colorado gold rush. Um, so they, you know, 1859, they left for Boulder, leaving their two-year-old daughter Mabel in the care of her maternal grandparents in Wisconsin. Uh, Mabel would eventually join them. Um, both uh, Mabel and Mary Dart uh, came out to Boulder in 1868 to join the Maxwells. So James Maxwell never found financial success in prospecting. Um, and you'll kind of notice throughout this presentation or the biography, um, lack of financial success is a recurring theme in Maxwell's biography. Um, but the move to Colorado did introduce Martha Maxwell to the new and varied wildlife of the American West. Um, her first stay to Colorado was cut short in 1862. Uh, she had to go back to Wisconsin. Her mother was sick and she needed to take care of her. She also needed to take care of uh, her husband's extended family. Um, and it was while she was in Wisconsin for those years that she first learned and discovered that she had a very extraordinary skill in taxidermy. Um, and she did eventually return to Boulder after a couple years in 1868, and she set about very quickly uh, her work of collecting and preserving specimens of Colorado's wildlife. Um, and she became an avid, really an obsessive collector of specimens. Um, and so her taxidermy techniques were cutting edge at the time. Uh, they seem to have developed simultaneously, but not in concert with other well-known taxidermy pioneers, um, including William Hornaday and Friedrich Webster. Um, and she was very highly skilled at taxidermy and made several advancements to the art that future taxidermists would copy. Um, so that included using natural poses for the animal specimens, using plaster body molds, uh, placing animals in their sort of natural surroundings and sort of artificial landscapes. Uh, she also invented a special pickling solution that would help keep the hides soft um, and also keep them from decaying and protect them against insect predation. Um, so she did a lot of really, you know, sort of innovative stuff with taxidermy. But she was also, in addition to being a skilled taxidermist, she was an accomplished naturalist. Uh, so she did discover a new species of screech owl um, that would actually end up being named after her. There's a picture of the owl there. Um, and she also acquired some of the very first specimens of the black-footed ferret. 
Um, so that type of ferret had first been identified by John James Audubon, um, but no one had been able to acquire specimens, so the scientific community was kind of like, eh, that seems suspicious, we're not sure you were telling the truth, Audubon. But then Maxwell was able to find specimens of it and kind of give veracity to Audubon's identification. Um, Maxwell also regularly corresponded with noted scientists of the day, including Robert Ridgway, the dude pictured up here on the screen. Uh, Ridgway is, uh, was a Smithsonian ornithologist, and he's the one that named the owl after Maxwell. Uh, he also contributed a catalog of birds that's included as an appendix to On the Plains and Among the Peaks. Um, other people Maxwell corresponded with included Spencer Fullerton Baird, he was also a naturalist at the Smithsonian and a curator at the Smithsonian. Um, and so Maxwell would send Baird lots of different bird specimens, not like fully stuffed birds, but like just their like shells sounds weird, but like their hides, that's probably the better term. Um, so she'd send him bird specimens and then Baird in return would send her um, catalogs of birds and mammals so that she could continue her study of natural sciences. Because uh, she was pretty much self-taught both when it came to taxidermy and natural science. Um, so she was just avidly trying to learn more and more throughout her life. So Maxwell's taxidermy collection you know, quickly grew. So did her reputation as this skilled taxidermist. So in addition to building her own collection, she would also start taking on outside work, um, uh, mounting specimens for other people as a way to earn money. Um, she also started to exhibit her collection at fairs, um, including the Colorado Agricultural Society Fair. Um, and by 1870, the Maxwell's family financial situation had worsened to the point that Maxwell thought it was prudent for her to sell her collection to you know, raise some money. Uh, so she sold her collection in 1870 to Shaw's Garden, uh, now known as the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. Um, it was, her collection at that point was about 600 specimens, uh, and she sold it for around $600. Uh, and that money allowed the Maxwell family to purchase land and to build a new house in Boulder. Um, and the, the land and the house are pictured there on the screen. Um, immediately after she sold her collection, she set about rebuilding it very quickly. Um, and soon it grew so large that she could no longer contain it in her house. Um, yes, her house had a very interesting decor scheme of just floor to ceiling, wall to wall, dead animals. Um, it's, it's, it's a design choice. Um, so anyway, uh, Maxwell soon decided, uh, both because she was running out of space in her home, um, but then also to try to raise money, she decided to open a museum. Um, and that, that museum, so this is a picture of Boulder, um, and you'll see there's a two-story brick building kind of in the back of that picture. Um, and that's actually the building where the museum was housed. Uh, so it was called the Rocky Mountain Museum, and it opened in Boulder, Colorado in June of 1874. So Maxwell intended the museum to serve a couple of purposes. Um, you know, she was seeing it as contributing to scientific knowledge at the time. She saw a big purpose of it was to educate the public, especially young women. She was very avid about women's education. Um, and also it was just a source of entertainment and curiosity that would appeal to tourists. So now I'll show you some uh, Specific examples of photographs of the taxidermy from the Rocky Mountain Museum kind of shows you some of the different types of taxidermy that were there. Um, so you see in these pictures a huge variety of bird specimens arranged on artificial trees. Um, and the photo on the left is an example of what was called anthropomorphic taxidermy. Um, this is a popular form of taxidermy at that time. It involved taking animals and putting them into human situations like weddings and banquets or dances. And this is an example of a bunch of monkeys playing poker at a table. Um, so that wasn't, the, the anthropomorphic taxidermy wasn't really scientific, it was more of just that sort of popular amusing curiosity. Uh, and then these are pictures of what at the time would have been very typical museum displays of taxidermy. Um, you just see like a bunch of dead animals lined up on shelves, on, you know, in cabinets, and it's just the, the animals sort of in isolation from each other. Um, that was kind of the standard mode um, before then and at that time, that was kind of what you would typically see in museums. 
Um, and then these photos are kind of, you know, what was truly innovative or uh, new about Maxwell's taxidermy. It was the centerpiece of her museum. Um, this is, you know, her taxidermy being placed in these kind of signature habitat groupings where you have this artificial landscape and the bird and you know the birds and mammals are all kind of placed in relation to each other, trying to recreate how they look out in the wild. Um, and so, you know, this kind of taxidermy was very novel at the time, but it would quickly kind of become the gold standard. And I'm guessing if you've ever been to a natural history museum that had taxidermy, you probably saw things more in these kind of natural grouping dioramas. So despite the praise that it received from both the general and the scientific community, the Rocky Mountain Museum was not a financial success. I told you this just keeps popping up. Um, so the sale of tickets for the museum couldn't offset the operating costs. Also, outside of the summer season, there really wasn't enough tourism in Boulder to support the museum. Um, and then even in 1875, they moved the museum to the more populous Denver, hoping that the bigger population would bring more people in. Um, but it never really uh, sort of achieved the, the financial success that they were hoping it would. And this is just yet another example, this time with Maxwell standing in and among one of her sort of natural habitat groupings with a bunch of her different animals. So Maxwell achieved her highest level of fame and recognition with her exhibit, Woman's Work, that was at the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Centennial of 1876. Uh, this is just a photograph of an aerial view of the exposition, all of the different show buildings that made up the exposition. So Maxwell recreated her taxidermy tableau as part of Colorado's exhibit within the Kansas and Colorado building, pictured here. And then this is a drawing of the interior of the building. Um, it shows woman wor woman's work on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see that it's kind of taking up that whole big side of that building. And then this is yet kind of another angle, another view of women's work. Um, I like this. You can get kind of a really good view of the cougar jumping through the air. And I also like that you can see the windows of the show building in the background. That just fascinates me for some reason. Um, but yeah, so women's work was this enormously popular exhibit. Um, you know, people were just fascinated and amazed by it. Um, but then was also very well received by scientists of the day. Uh, but despite all of that, you know, favorable reviews, good press that it was getting, um, it was not a financial success. Um, part of the sort of lack of financial uh, success of the woman's work can be attributed to two factors. Um, one was that the Colorado legislature had promised Maxwell that they would reimburse her for the costs of shipping this ginormous uh, exhibit to Philadelphia, uh, and they refused to honor that. Um, and then the second reason was that, you know, the main source of income that Maxwell had at the exposition was selling photos of herself and of her collection. And the Centennial Photographic Company at the exposition had pretty much had a monopoly on photographs. And they could not keep up with the demand that there was for photos of her exhibit. Um, and when Maxwell tried to sell her own copies of photographs, uh, the company threatened to shut down her photo stands completely. So she wasn't able to get as much money from it as she had hoped. Uh, in the following years, Maxwell continued efforts to try to make her collection profitable, but was never able to really do so. Um, she passed away at the age of 50 in 1881 from an ovarian tumor. Um, and after her death, the logistics and cost of shipping and storing this truly massive collection um, through a bunch of sort of mistakes and foibles eventually resulted in the loss and destruction of her collection by the early 20th century. So written descriptions and photographs are really all we have left of her groundbreaking taxidermy. So now I'll turn to talking about Dart's book, On the Plains and Among the Peaks. So this book was one of the efforts that was undertaken after the centennial to both try to raise Maxwell's profile as a naturalist, uh, but then also to try to bring in some much needed money. So the book was a collaboration between Martha Maxwell and her half-sister, Mary Dart. Um, Dart and Maxwell maintained a close friendship throughout the entirety of Maxwell's life. 
So just a little bit about uh, Mary Dart pictured here. So Dart graduated from the Baraboo Collegiate Institute in Wisconsin in 1865. Afterwards, she taught briefly at Catherine Beecher's Milwaukee Female College before moving out to Boulder to join the Maxwells. Um, she would frequently accompany Maxwell and her hunting parties, you know, traipsing through the Rocky Mountains in sometimes very dangerous weather conditions, you know, shooting and retrieving specimens for her for Maxwell's taxidermy collection. Um, Dart married uh, Minister Nathan Thompson in 1870 and with him moved to Massachusetts in 1875. Uh, Dart had some experience as a published writer. Uh, she had contributed some poems and essays to the Baraboo Republic newspaper between 1865 and 1867. So Dart began writing on the plains and among the peaks in 1877, working with Maxwell in composing the book. Uh, it was eventually published in 1879 by the Philadelphia firm of Claxton, Rimson, and Haffelfinger. Um, so kind of the structure content of the book, uh, it opens with the visitors to woman's work who are just inundating uh, both Dart and Maxwell with qu all these questions about the exhibit and about Maxwell. Um, Dart then backs up and talks about the opening of the Rocky Mountain Museum. She then backs up further and talks about Maxwell's life in Wisconsin and how she first learned taxidermy. Then there's a series of different hunting trips uh, around the Rocky Mountains and Colorado Territory, you know, describing all of those hunting and collecting. Um, you, know, you also get descriptions of Maxwell actually preparing taxidermy specimens. Um, and the, the book ends with a, with a description of the creation and installation of the Women's Work exhibit at the Centennial Exposition. Um, and then finally, there's two appendices at the end of the book. These are catalogs from noted scientists of the day um, who are cataloging all of the specimens in Maxwell's collection. So as is kind of the common trend now, this book was well-reviewed by popular press and scientific communities, uh, but again, not the financial success that she was hoping for. So one of my goals in publishing this critical edition, <laughs> excuse me, so uh, one of the uh, points in the, uh, publishing this critical edition is to shift the focus from just the visual spectacle of Maxwell's taxidermy, taxidermy to examining Dart's book as a significant literary, literary artifact in its own right. Um, you know, the book is interesting because it shows how Dart is creating this carefully crafted image of Maxwell that scrupulously balances um, you know, scrupulously balances the sort of riveting hunting expeditions on the Colorado frontier with descriptions of the meticulous study and practice of natural history, and then these scenes of motherly care and concern that Maxwell had for her daughter Mabel. So even with all of the various fields of interest related to On the Plains and Among the Peaks, Maxwell consistently draws the most attention both from her contemporaries and from 20th and 21st century scholars um, with her gender. So Maxwell's status as a woman naturalist and how it spoke to broader ideas about women and their place in society was also a key focus for Dart and Maxwell. Much of that focus um, kind of centered on Maxwell's use of guns and her killing of animals. So Dart's careful positioning of Maxwell's feminine identity can be explained in part when put alongside the big game hunting narratives of men in the Victorian age. In order to avoid readers equating Maxwell with these men, Dart takes great care to position Maxwell as almost the antithesis of a Victorian big game hunter. For example, there's one section of the book where Dart uh, rep, uh, gives us a conversation that Maxwell had with a female friend where the friend asks, you fearful woman, how can you have the heart to take so many lives? Uh, and then Maxwell replies with the quote on the screen, I suppose you think me very cruel, but I doubt if I am as much so as you. There isn't a day that goes by, a day you don't tacitly consent to have some creature killed that you may eat it. I never take life for such carnivorous purposes. All must die sometime. I only shorten the period of consciousness that I may give their forms a perpetual memory. And I leave it to you, which is the more cruel, to kill to eat or kill to immortalize. So in explaining herself, Maxwell justifies her hunting not as a hero heroic pursuit and mastery of dangerous wild beasts, but as a rational method of preserving animals. 
Rather than emphasize the bloody conquest of the hunt, like the big game hunters do, Maxwell focuses on the end result of her hunting, the production and proliferation of natural history knowledge. And similarly, at another point in the book, Dart recounts Maxwell's successful hunting of a buffalo. She makes sure to note that to shoot such a large animal like that wasn't really a stunning achievement. Uh, she writes, any man could have done what she did there. I have seen many a one who had and considered it almost honor enough for a lifetime and told of it with no end of flourishes. Well, it don't take much to satisfy some people. Now I'll tell you of something which she had reason to be proud. So Dart then goes on to recount Maxwell's discovery of the new species of screech owl and concludes by saying, a thousand years hence, when all people are mourning over the extinction of large animals from America, her name will live on associated with a variety of the bird that has been from time immemorial a symbol of wisdom. So what's important here in Dart's telling is not a hyperbolic tale of this hyper-masculine struggle between man and beast, but rather you know, careful feats of perseverance, careful observation, and keen intellect, areas in which, as Dart tells us, Maxwell excelled. Yet, On the Plains and Among the Peaks ends not with a reminder of Maxwell's trailblazing, but with a worry about Maxwell's daughter's Mabel's education. And in fact, a lot of Maxwell's focus on earning money for her collection, um, it was really because she was concerned about paying for Mabel's education. Um, and so that was really sort of the driving focus behind Maxwell wanting to make money off of her collection. So the book's final chapter concludes with a paragraph calling attention to Maxwell's ceaseless exertions and self-denials for her daughter's higher education, and reminds viewers that Maxwell's work in natural history does not, quote, diminish the sweetness of true womanhood or render the heart once gentle and tender, harsh and cold. So the book allows Maxwell to be an innovative taxidermist and a skilled naturalist, but at its end, she's safely returned to the role of a caring mother, lest readers think that she has, she has strayed too far from the prescribed gender roles of her day. So although On the Plains and Among the Peaks presents readers with a progressive view of women's education, abilities, and accomplishments, its treatment of Native Americans is decidedly more problematic. The indigenous peoples of the Western US occupy the periphery of her book, and their occasional presence reveals a troubling but not atypical depiction of white settlers' views of the American West. So the book takes place against an unacknowledged backdrop of excessive violence towards Native Americans particularly the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864, in which hundreds of Native Americans at a Cheyenne and Arapahoe camp, many of whom were women and children, were brutally murdered and mutilated by members of the Colorado troops led by Colonel John Chivington. So prior to that massacre, settlers in the West had increasingly encroached on Native lands, a problem that was only made worse with Colorado's gold rush, which had brought the Maxwells to Boulder. So the Sand Creek Massacre is never mentioned in On the Plains and Among the Peaks, but since the Maxwells moved to Boulder in 1859, they and Dart would undoubtedly have been familiar with the event and its aftermath. In the book, Dart portrays Native Americans alternately as dangerous nuisances that impede white settlers from taking full advantage of the West, and as romanticized others that Dart clearly equates with the region's large buffalo herds, noble and majestic but destined to vanish from the landscape. So in one scene, for example, um, Dart describes how you know, on a hunting trip, Maxwell came across these two white, white frontiersmen, and both Maxwell and the frontiersmen mistook each other for Native Americans and then almost shot each other. Um, and Dart characterizes this scene as comedic, sort of playing it off for laughs of, oh, ha ha, we almost killed each other, isn't that funny? Um, and, but you know, it has that comedic quality to it, but it also underscores the attitude towards Native Americans that many white settlers had. Um, and it's sort of portray it shows Dart portraying Native Americans as innately hostile and combative and ignoring white settlers' roles in creating such strained relations. 
And then in a later section, Dart describes how um, while approaching a herd of buffalo, Maxwell's hunting party um, came upon a Native American man who was also pursuing buffalo. Uh, Dart marveled at the skill of the hunter and his pony, um, and she contrasts it with the atrocities of white settlers shooting buffalo from the windows of passing trains. She was very against that. Um, but Dart describes a sort of innate sense of connectedness between the Native American man and his pony, and notes that the pony, you know, quote, seemed instinct with his will, and without being touched by his hands, which were busy sending arrows into the beast, the buffalo, uh, at every turn it veered and tacked, duplicating every movement the buffalo made. So while this might at first seem like a compliment about the man's skill, upon closer examination, it subtly dehumanizes him, placing him closer to the brutes that he hunts rather than the white settler hunters in Maxwell's party. This animalization of Native Americans is made even more explicit at another point in the book where Dart lists them alongside other herds of animals, you know, riding vast herds of deer, buffalo, Indians, and other wild horses. So Dart is establishing a parallel between the noble beasts, the buffalo, and the Native Americans, both being inextricably linked to the fantasy of the West and both under, under threat from, from the settlement of white people in the West. So in another scene towards the end of the book, Dart describes Maxwell's visit to uh, Hot Sulphur Springs. Dart acknowledges that the Ute tribe previously enjoyed use of the hot springs, but can no longer do so. And in this extended quote, she writes, alas for the poor Utes, they can no longer submerge their sick horses, papooses, and puppies in its purifying waters. They were said to hold them in great reverence as possessing powers little less than miraculous. To judge from their appearance, they hold water when it, wherever found as too sacred to be used except in last extremity. It is useless to longer imagine that the picture memory holds of their utter ugliness and filth can ever be changed. Hot chemicals are no longer possible to them and cold water would be powerless on a ute. So the brief glimmer of sympathy that starts this quote um, is severely undercut in the scene by Dart's denigration and mockery of the Utes uh, with her insistence on their ugliness and filth. After this scene, Dart immediately returns to describing Maxwell's focus on searching for elk um, and it abruptly ends the discussion of Native Americans, effectively signaling that they are of no real concern or consequence in Dart's retelling of Maxwell's work. Yet the appearance of Native Americans, albeit briefly in the text, um, you know, offers us a fuller picture of the context in which Maxwell was completing her natural history work. So in contrast to her portrayal of Native Americans, Dart offers a much more nuanced and thoughtful look at the animals of the American West. She showcases various animals as individual creatures. Um, she has several episodes where she talks about the different pets that Martha Maxwell had, like a porcupine and an antelope and some pet snakes. Um, but at the same time, you know, she's showing that the ultimate purpose of these animals was to serve as raw material for Maxwell's taxidermy. So Dart, Dart, in her first extended discussion of Maxwell's taxidermy work, you know, talks about just how you know, how, care, how much careful and focused work it involved, but also how kind of gross and disgusting it was. Um, so she talks about one example where Maxwell is working with a turkey buzzard that by the time she got the specimen, it was already kind of putrefying and rotting. It was like really disgusting. Um, and Dart writes, too and sick to endure its presence a moment longer. She would retreat for a while, but as soon as it was possible to summon the strength and resolution, go to work again. It was more than a week, however, before she recovered, the effects, recovered from the effects of such a disgusting task, enough to be able to eat an ordinary meal. And it was many weeks before the mounted bird could be taken from the outer shed that gave him shelter and have a place among her other birds. So you can kind of see here just kind of how like, you know, actually kind of gross and bloody the taxidermy work was. Um, but Maxwell did prefer to kill the animals herself, um, both so that she had an opportunity to observe them while alive, also because she would take measurements of them immediately after they were killed. Um, she felt that that gave her the ability to more accurately and truthfully uh, recreate the animals after death. 
Um, and in fact, as Dart and Maxwell kind of express in the book, accurate, well-executed taxidermy requires intimate observation and contact with animal bodies. Like you have to get your hands dirty and really get into that messy work. So at multiple points in On the Plains and Among the Peaks, Dart takes great pains to emphasize the scientific value of Maxwell's work, often in an attempt to mitigate the inherent violence of the work. Um, but there's a couple of scenes in the book, and I'll talk about two of them specifically, where it reveals that that situation was not quite as neutralized as Maxwell or Dart might have wished, and in fact reveal this kind of unsettling combination of violence and sentimentality. So the first one, uh, the quote you see on the screen, um, Maxwell had killed a, a mother hawk and then had sort of collected two baby hawks that she would raise only to later kill for the collection. So Dart writes, both birds reached Boulder in safety the next day where they were fed and cuddled and made happy until their robes of snowy white down were of the most desirable length when a little chloroform induced them to stop growing. A nest, like the one they occupied in their, with, uh, in their native tree, was procured. They were stuffed and placed in it with their mouths open and their necks stretched upward, with their mother, which, with a rabbit and her talons, was suspended over them. So the kind of nurturing, cute, maternal quality of this episode is quickly disturbed with what is just the most fantastically euphemistic description of killing something I think I've come across. You know, the little chloroform induced them to stop growing. Like, okay. Um, but yeah, you have that kind of weird jarring moment, but then at the end, you have this maternal nurturing image that's recreated, that Maxwell recreates with these dead bird bodies, like the mama bird feeding her babies. So it's this kind of weird mix of, aw, cute, and ew, gross. Um, and then in the second scene that has the same kind of vibe to it, um, this involves, again, uh, two baby bear cubs. Um, and I'll read through this long quote. So the mother of the cubs was killed at the same time as their capture. Ten days or more after her death, her skin being mounted was placed in the museum. Mrs. Maxwell, to test her work and to see whether the cubs still remembered their mother, let them out into the room. Selecting her from the other animals, they ran whining and jumped about her, licking her face and seemed overjoyed at finding her again. But when conscious that she would not return their caresses, their grief was touching in the extreme. Standing up and stroking her face with their little paws in the most pleading manner, they licked her nose and cheeks and moaned like two heartbroken children. It was more than Mrs. Maxwell could endure, and with tears of sympathy for their disappointment, she took them away. So again, we get this like perverse, disturbing image of a dead, stuffed mother bear and her living, inconsolable cubs. It's just such a weird image. Um, and it gives readers this very jarring combination of the sentimental and the violent. Um, you get these cute, playful cubs, and then their you know, immediate, very visceral distress forces us to reckon with the ethics of Maxwell's taxidermy. So to kind of uh, bring things to a close, I'll tell you a little bit more about what happened after the centennial to Maxwell and what happened to her collection. Um, so after the centennial, Maxwell moved to Boston in 1878. She took some science classes at the Women's Laboratory as part of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She taught some taxidermy classes to pay for her tuition. Um, you know, and she did make a couple of brief trips back to Boulder, but really she stayed on the East Coast for the rest of her life. Um, in 1879, she moved to Brooklyn, New York. Um, she leased some land on Rockaway Beach with, a, with an eye towards creating a museum where she could display her collection. So that museum was opened in 1880, um, but again, not the super financial success she was hoping for. So during her time in New York, Maxwell's health began to fail. Um, also, it, during her time on the East Coast, her marriage to James had deteriorated. Um, that's partly because of uh, money issues, partly because James was, you know, became less and less supportive of her work, um, and then also they were separated for that whole time. James stayed uh, in Boulder for that entire duration while Maxwell was on the East Coast. Um, so after Maxwell's death from an ovarian tumor in 1881, again, she died very young, only 50 years old. Um, but after her death, her daughter Mabel traveled to Rockaway Beach. She tried to turn around her mother's business, 
Um, she was able to pay off Maxwell's debts, um, but she wasn't able to earn enough money to move the collection. Um, and Mabel did try to find museums and universities that would be interested in taking and purchasing the collection, um, but she wasn't able to find any takers. Um, and by the time various scientific institutions realized the value of Maxwell's collection, uh, both to science and to history, it was too late. So there's a few competing narratives about what happened to her taxidermy. Uh, the first collection that she had, the 600 specimens that she sold to Shaw's Garden in 1870, that wasn't taken care of, um, and it became degraded to the point of being unsalvageable. There's some uh, suggestions that I've found that say that maybe some of her specimens from woman's work were saved at the Smithsonian as part of an exhibit on the centennial, but I've never been able to verify that yet. Um, but then Mary Dart, uh, she published uh, a report called What Became of Mrs. Maxwell's Natural History Collection. So that report was presented in 1924 to the Colorado Historical Society. Um, so Dart herself began to try to trace Maxwell's collection in 1893. Um, you know, there were reports that she had left it with this guy in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, and when Dart found the collection, she realized that it had been improperly stored and handled, like left outside in a record snowstorm mishandled. Um, and any kind of attempts to salvage the collection were unsuccessful, both because, you know, at least in those early years, it was still hard to find an institution that wanted to invest in it. Um, but then also, you know, really, you know, roughly by about 1906, the State University of Colorado, you know, finally decided, yes, we want to preserve this collection. It's important. Let's go get it. Um, but by 1906, the collection, or what remained of it at that point, was just too far gone. It was either going to be prohibitively expensive to repair, or it's just like there was nothing left to repair. The specimens were just so degraded. Um, so Dart notes rather succinctly at the end of that report, the story of Mrs. Maxwell's collection is ended. And it's partly because of that loss of Maxwell's collection that Dart's book is so important. Um, you know, it does provide us with a record of Maxwell's important scientific contributions and taxidermy innovations. It gives us a really interesting glimpse at life in the 19th century American West. And it does testify to a woman's resolve to show through her work that a woman was every bit as capable as a man at succeeding in traditionally male-dominated fields. So yeah, uh, thank you guys for listening to me. I hope you uh, enjoyed hearing about Martha Maxwell. I think she's super fascinating, so. First of all, we wanna make sure everybody knows that your book is here today. It yes. was just recently published and it's here. So <laughs> awesome. that's awesome. And yeah. that's the cover of it. Yes. And I love that you, you put by Mary Dart because it really is a critical edition yeah. of her book. Mm -hmm. So can you talk just for some of our students who mm -hmm. may be just learning about what a critical edition is and what that means. So what does that mean? It's a, it's a reprinting of Mary's work with your commentary. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit specifically about that. Yeah, no, so essentially when you say critical edition, um, the way that's different from just like, you know, random editions or like, you know, the sort of existing facsimile copies you can find online, the difference is that, um, you know, I've gone through the text and of course edited it um, and I added, you know, lots of explanatory footnotes, you know, offering kind of additional context, things that 21st century readers wouldn't necessarily know stuff about geography or about like women's history or taxidermy, giving all of that kind of information. Um, and then, you know, it also involves inclu uh, you know, writing a you know, fairly extensive introduction where I offer that kind of historical literary context so that people can, you know, f more fully appreciate the importance and contribution that this text is and how to understand its place in literature and the history of science. Thank you so much. And you'll be available to sign copies as yes. well. So if anybody wants to read the words from Mary, from Martha, from Julie, <laughs> you can get all of them in your book. Yes. Which brings me to one more question, which is now that you've done all of this work and all this research, I wonder, because there are, of course, the quotes from Martha. It's right from her words. But the book is by Mary. And mm -hmm. so there's so much of it from her perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Now that you've gone through all that, how, do you feel that there's any s sensationalizing from Mary 
of who Martha was? Or do you feel that it's 100% accurate? Or, you know, what's your sort of take on the tone and the voice? Um, I don't think it's necessarily that uh, Mary Dart is sensationalizing Maxwell's story because, of course, you could she could have like gone really sensational and made it really lurid. Um, but I think there is definitely a careful curation, both on the part of Dart and Maxwell, um, of making sure they're presenting the right image of Maxwell. They mm -hmm. want to show her as yes, she's this great scientist, this skilled taxidermist, but she's also still a refined woman. You know, she's still a very caring, nurturing mother, and so you know. I think they were wanting to kind of walk that, do that sort of balancing act of showing that yes, she's sort of innovative and doing these great things, but she's not um, running afoul of kind of societal expectations for women at the time. And do you think that they were doing that for the, the purposes of society or because that really was how she was? I mean, it's a little hard to know, I'm sure. It's a little hard to say, um, you know, but I will say that, um, you know, from, you know, doing more research into Maxwell's life, you know, she was very acutely aware of how her work and how her public persona was kind of making herself a role model for women. Ah. And so she was very concerned with, you know, being a good role model for women's education, showing just exactly what women could achieve. Mm -hmm. So I think there was that kind of pressure on both Maxwell and Dart that they wanted to make sure they were giving that right public image. Fascinating. Great. Uh, and then one question just about your research. Um, you know, it's fascinating to learn because you had the, the words from the book, but then you had to do so much research um, outside of that. Can you talk a little bit about where you found things, how you found things, how you got into that world of it? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind, it's kind of interesting because there's a pre-COVID part of that and a post-COVID right, part of that. Right, right. Um, so, you know, pre-COVID, I think it was in 2018, um, I actually got to take a trip to Denver to the History Colorado Center and go to their archives and look through Martha Maxwell's papers um, and, you know, really just get to geek out looking at all of these archival documents and lots of taxidermy photos, which was like my favorite part of that whole trip. Really? Um, yeah, I, I, I just loved looking at the taxidermy photos. Um, and I was taking so many pictures, and I think the librarians were kind of giving me weird looks, like, why? And I'm like, it's awesome. <laughs> um, so there was that kind of aspect to the research of actually going to an archive and spending several hours looking through stuff. Um, and then post-COVID, like, I was finishing up this book right um, in sort of late spring, early summer of 2020, so right when everything was shut down. So I was doing a lot of work from home online. So you know, making a lot of use of online databases, online archives, doing that kind of other side of the research work. Great, well thank you for that. Yeah. Have you ever done any taxidermy? I have not. I've often thought maybe at some future point in my life when I have free time, maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll take a taxidermy class and learn. Um, you know, I've always just been fascinated by taxidermy since I was a little kid, but nope, have not yet actually done taxidermy. Okay. <laughs> um, and so my last question for you is a little bit more general, and mm -hmm. that's about inspiration and advice for students and, and for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things we love to ask our guests is, uh, what advice do you have for students? I mean, based on your experience and your knowledge, what do you wish you had known when you were in school? Uh, you know, what advice do you have for students today? Well, that's a good question. I think kind of related to this, um, you know, one thing that always stood out to me, you know, later on in my educational career was, you know, pursuing things that got me jazzed and excited and interested, not just doing, not just pursuing the research topics that I thought would be like, quote unquote, studious or academic. Um, but it's like weird things like, yeah, I want to go look at dead animals and talk about <laughs> dead animals and I'll, I'll turn that into academic stuff. Um, you know, and so I think that's kind of maybe my recommendation to students is to find that thing or that item that you're passionate about or gets you really excited and gets you like really nerdy and geeky um, and pursue that and find a way to make that work for you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Well, we will be on the radio today at 3 p.m. on KSU Thunder 91.1, and that'll turn into a podcast, which will be on our website. So if you're interested in learning more, we'll be there. But to close up, I'd love to say first, congratulations thank on you. being our faculty distinguished lecturer. And thank you so much for spending the time and, and for doing such great work on discovering this, this awesome woman's past. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Great. Well, she'll be around for book sale and signing right now. Yep. But otherwise, we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.